Morning, Mr. Baker. Good morning. All right, so I think we're live. I think we're good on YouTube. I Fantastic. Just kind of checking everything. I hope everybody is having a wonderful day. And we are excited to be doing this um, live with you guys. My name is Derek Killam. If I've never met any of you, I work with Intune Music and Sound. Morning, I Mr. kind of split my time. Um, good morning. See if I can get that loop out of here. Is that me? I think right. it so might be you. Good on you too, Could be. Yeah, I, don't think, I don't think it's me. I got it. Cool. So if I haven't met you before, my name is Derek Killam, and I work with Into Music and Sound. Uh, I spend a lot of time in Odessa, spend a lot of time in Alito, Abilene, Midland, all over the place. And uh, we're excited. We've been talking to, to people. Uh, some of the guys that call on band directors have come back and said, got questions. I don't know necessarily how to answer them. Um, fortuitous conversation with my friend, Mr. Baker, started talking about it. He said, yeah, I'm doing some of this and I knew he was. So I asked him if it would be okay to set this up so he could speak uh, with all of us and kind of walk us through some of this. So before I turn it over to him, uh, I do want to say a couple of things. Number one, this is on YouTube. We chose that primarily because of me because I didn't have Facebook going. And we thought that'd be a great idea. We have learned, and we sent an email about this, that uh, there's a chat function that goes with YouTube, but to utilize that chat, chat function, if you haven't signed in, you need to sign in with either your Google account or uh, if you have a YouTube account, sign in with that. That should enable the, the chat function. Uh, we thought it might be smarter to do that instead of having everybody shout down their questions or uh, there's going to be some latency. I'm just telling you that up front, that there's some latency involved with what we do because we're all remote. We do think it's important to socially distance, and I guess this is by definition social distancing. So uh, one thing you need to know, if you type a question or if you type a comment, it's going to take about 20 seconds before we see it. So don't get, don't get impatient. Don't get frustrated with this. We will get your question. We have people monitoring just questions, and uh, we're excited to do that. And also, you know, I... I don't know if there's any other things that I want to tell you. Uh, one of our people yesterday in our test did find out that even though they signed in to YouTube, they still had to agree to a channel. I don't think that's a huge issue. It just creates a place for you to deposit uh, videos as you enjoy them or collect them. So I'll be quiet now. We've, we, we're going to try and keep this about an hour. Um, if it goes longer, it goes longer. And Mr. Baker's graciously agreed. If it gets too long, then we'll just try so, uh, another session at another time. So, um, you know, I don't know how he would want me to introduce him. I'm gonna tell you he's a friend. I'm gonna tell you, I think he is very knowledgeable and that he is very gracious to share this with us this morning. This is Eric Baker. He's the department chair uh, for fine arts at Odessa College, fine musician. Uh, if you've never seen Current Nine, you need to check that out. They're pretty awesome. Um, kind of a, a, a really cool throwback band for me. I mean, they use horns and they have multiple vocalists just a good deal and they're great musicians so anyway having said all that i'm gonna get out of the way eric baker we appreciate you enlighten us thanks derek thanks for having me thank you to intune music and sound for sponsoring something like this um and thanks for the special plug for current nine and and all the various ensembles i also get to play with the midland odessa symphony and uh, of course i'm the band director and the chair of music uh actually all of visual and performing arts here at odessa college so i'm very fortunate um and i'm very blessed and i'm coming to you here live from my office at odessa college i am the only one in the music building right now so i'm appropriately socially distanced. Uh, most people I think that know me would be happy to know that I'm distancing myself from them. Uh, but basically, uh, I just wanted to come to you and show you a little bit of some of the ideas and some of the things that we've been doing at Odessa College in the band program. Now, um, other things are going on for our choir program, and it may be worth, <clears throat> pardon me, reaching out to Dr. Juan Hernandez, our choir director, about some of the things that he's doing uh, specifically, but I will tell you what I'm doing. Um, another thing that I want to say is, um, this is, this is going to be frustrating. <laughs> um, everything we do as music, as musicians, uh, relies on real time collaboration, that instant feedback and that communication between artists and performers. So 
I understand that everything I'm going to show you is a compromise. It's not a perfect situation, but I'm hoping that we can use some of these things to at least make the best out of a very difficult situation. Now, I am also just going to show you the things that I'm doing. I am by no means saying that they're the best way. I would love to see anybody in the chat who, um, who has better ideas or improvements or ways to be more efficient or quicker. All of those things uh, would be so welcome in a place like this where we're trying to bring as many music educators together to share what they know. So I thought it might be easiest to start with equipment. Um, so many times the, the questions I'm getting asked are, you know, what microphone are you using? What is this microphone? What is that? What program? So I thought it might be helpful just to start with the gear. What is the equipment that you need or could have to do some remote teaching in a way that is um, helpful and efficient and works well for your students? So I'm going to try something now uh, here in a few minutes that hopefully you'll be able to see my desk and look at some of the gear that I've got set up. I've just used this as my primary workstation for all of these remote classes that we're doing. So at Odessa College, um, I the, the first thing I knew that I needed to get was a good microphone. Um, it's so important that the students be able to hear what I'm saying clearly and well. And so I'm just using a vocal microphone, a dynamic vocal microphone. Um, by the way, when it comes to gear, Derek is going to have uh, access to lists of equipment, either this specific gear that I'm showing or something equivalent that Intune can provide for you. And so all of the purchasing and all the acquisition of this equipment, I'm going to leave in their very capable hands. But starting from my voice, the first thing that needs to happen is you need to get a good microphone. Now, I happen to be using a microphone that plugs in via XLR, the three-pronged standard um, microphone cable jack. However, there are lots and lots of very good USB microphones that you can plug directly into your computer and be guaranteed to get some pretty decent sound right away. So they all come with their various functions and price points and features, um, but a USB microphone is going to be the quickest way to plug a microphone, a quality microphone, into your computer and be able to start teaching. If you want to use something a little bit more powerful, or for me at OC, I just had to go raid my closets <laughs> and, and grab the equipment that I usually use for concerts and bring it into my office. And so we, we didn't have a good USB microphone here in the band hall, so I decided to use one of our vocal microphones. That's going to require an audio interface. And here's where I'm going to try to switch the camera. Hopefully this will work for you. Hey, I think it did. So right here is a small box this is an audio interface this happens to be a two channel audio interface this allows the standard microphone jack the xlr to be converted digitally into a usb port which just plugs into the back of my imac now this particular audio interface is a two channel in audio interface i can plug in two different things here i could potentially plug in a vocal microphone and then over here I have right here a second microphone that I use for my trumpet playing. So whenever I need to demonstrate something on my trumpet to my students, I use this microphone because it's tuned up a little bit better for trumpet versus this vocal microphone. It would be way too loud on the vocal microphone if I were to play my trumpet. So this audio interface has two inputs. It also has two outputs on the back which can feed my speakers. And then, of course, you have your knobs here in the front to dial in uh, the volume. I'm listening to all those things through this cable, which goes to my headphones. These headphones are some Sennheiser 280 Pro. They're over the ear. They're a little bit more comfortable. Um, and I don't have any latency if I were using, like, AirPods or something with Bluetooth. You're more than welcome to use Bluetooth headphones. That's going to be no problem. Use what you have. But if you do, just know that that's going to introduce a little bit of latency. Now... If you just need one or two channels in your microphone, then a simple audio interface like this is all you're going to need to get really good sound into your computer. There will be various settings for the programs you're using, and we can talk about you know, settings for Zoom or something at a different time, or if you have questions in the chat, you can post those there. But if all you need are two channels in, then you're golden. However, if you need more channels than your audio interface can give you, you're going to have to start to get creative. One of the easiest ways, I think, is to use a separate mixer. Now, this mixer is a QSC TouchMix 16. Uh, we bought it 
at Odessa College to be able to take our jazz band out and to do concerts where I need lots and lots of channels, you know, up to 16 different channels into a mixer. This would be complete overkill, I think, for anyone trying to just get set up to do some remote teaching uh, in their classroom right now. This, like I said, this is 16 channels with four extra stereo inputs. It's, it's crazy. It is very powerful. It does give me a lot of control and it is very nice to use, but I don't think you need to go out and spend the kind of money for this. Um, usually just a simple four to six, maybe even eight channel uh, mixer even if it's an analog mixer, you can get for just a few hundred dollars. That's going to do more, again, more than enough. So again, you need the digital interface if you just need one to two inputs. If you're going to use more than that, you're going to need to put them in here. So what I have here is the signal from the microphone is actually going into channel one of my mixer. That gives me independent control of that volume. And then all of that goes out the mixer into the interface. So the interface is giving my computer any sound that I put into this mixer. You have individual controls over these things. Like I said, if my vocal mic needs to be turned up um, and my trumpet microphone needs to be turned down, that's fine. This mixer gives me quick access to mute one or the other microphones so they don't have multiple microphones open at the same time. That would further cloud the sound. And then all of this uh, is going into the digital interface, which I can listen to any sound that's coming through right here on my headphones. And that's important. So your various computer settings will vary, of course, but since all of this is USB, it should work relatively easily on a Windows-based or a Mac-based computer. I'm a Mac person, um, and so I've just decided I'm going to try to keep things Mac compatible as much as possible, and that works for me, but it's by no means the only way to do things. So that gives you a little bit of an example of the gear. How do I need to get it set up? Now, at OC, we're primarily using Zoom for our music classes. Um, it has its pros and its cons, and um, hopefully we're getting more and more secure using Zoom uh, over, the, over the last few weeks. So for us, Zoom works pretty well. What that looks like is I will start a Zoom class. I have three recurring Zoom meetings, a Monday, a Wednesday, a Friday, and my jazz band students call in to that Zoom meeting regularly at the same time we were having class. Jazz band meets Monday, Wednesday, Friday at one o'clock. So those students are logging in and they are joining me for a Zoom call at one o'clock. Now Zoom and all these other programs um, are just not powerful enough and there are too many variables involved to do real-time collaborative performance. There's just nothing out there right now. There may be a few very high-end or specialty softwares that allow you to do it with one or two people, sort of, but the, the laws of physics are at play. And so I have had to, sadly, abandon the idea that I'm going to be able to get all of my jazz band students on a Zoom call, count them off, and we can all play together and hear one another in real time. It just doesn't work. So again, I've had to make some sacrifices. I've had to make some compromises. And one of those compromises is, even though we're together in a synchronous nature, we're all together in the Zoom call, I'm doing semi-asynchronous performing. And I have to turn a lot of the control over to them, and I have to trust them to do some things. So what I will typically do is we have decided that for our spring project, we're going to do one of the many sorts of virtual jazz band movie type files. Um, we've chosen a piece from our repertoire they're all working on those individual parts at home and of course I coach them through our classes. My request is that they record themselves simply just on their smartphone playing along to the track that I've given them so that all of the audio files will be in sync. I will take those files from them, drop them into an audio software, most likely GarageBand because it's cheap and it's, it's free and it's on my iMac. Um, and then I will take those video files out and put them into something like iMovie, again, a very basic thing, and then hopefully have something that we can produce and say, hey, even though we were all quarantined, we still did something to push our art form, art form forward. So that's the plan, and we'll see what works. You can be looking for that uh, hopefully in a few weeks. So how do we rehearse? How do I get them to understand what's going on? Well, I use software for this. One of the greatest softwares that I've ever come across as a music educator is a piece of programming called AnyTune Pro or AnyTune. 
AnyTune is compatible for Windows or Mac. It's also compatible for Android and iOS. I first came across this app on my iPad. Um, I was able to drop in any audio file that I had and then completely change it, transform it, do lots of really incredible things to it, um, and, and then be able to use that as a teaching tool or a rehearsal tool for my programs. In jazz, so much of what we do is about listening and copying style. My students can play their instruments well, they can read well, they have good time, but many of them are young and have not been steeped in jazz tradition and jazz style and interpretations. So I have found that a good amount of listening is very, very important for them. Uh, not because they can't play their part, but because they need to not, they need to understand how. I'm always telling my jazz band students, it's so little about what you play and so much about how you play it in this particular uh, style, in this genre. So I'm going to skip over and do a, a screen share of this particular bit of programming on my Mac, which is called AnyTune Pro. It is, uh, it is a paid app. I think that's the pro version. It is a paid uh, bit of software, but it is completely amazing. It is so powerful in what it can do. So what you see here is the waveform for a file that I have dropped into AnyTune Pro. Now this happens to be the piece of music that we're gonna be working on. So I was able to, uh, I actually contacted the artist who recorded this and I told them who I was and what I was doing. And they said, here is our audio track so that your students can have it and then they can rehearse with it. And so thank you to the Hunter Tones, a phenomenal band uh, who is doing some really interesting music. They've arranged a few of their pieces for big band, came across it, I thought it was great. And so I decided, hey, we're gonna try to do one of these songs for our project. So thank you to the Hunter Tones for being so generous and free with their, with their tracks. They gave me both the full band mix and they gave me a mix that their rhythm section people listened to that is stripped of most of the horns so that it's a cleaner mix and the rhythm section can hear a little bit better. Thank you so much. They're phenomenal. Now, one of the things that's important about this particular audio track is the song actually starts right here. I'm going to click play and I hope this isn't too loud. Okay, that's where the track actually starts. But most of my students are going to be using their iPhone or some other device and they're just going to click play and they're not going to know exactly where to start. And as you can hear, there's a, a tuba line, a bass line, some trombones and tenor saxophones in that opening section. And if I don't give them any kind of an intro, it's going to be very difficult for them to catch that first note. It's just going to be a lot of trial and error, and it's going to make my, my part difficult to, to tweak and get all put together at the beginning. So what I did was I used GarageBand, and in just about five minutes was able to add a two-count introduction in a metronome. And so you can kind of see that waveform starting here. Now listen, now that there's a metronome installed, the students can have a much better idea of the tempo and where exactly to begin. Now, one of the cool things about this piece is the beat and the rhythm is really funky. And so believe it or not, that is the right tempo. And as you'll hear a little bit later. So this piece, this, this AnyTune Pro now is a WAV file that I can send out or an MP3. You can choose how to export it, that which, whichever will suit your needs best. I can take this, send it to the students, have them set up their phone, get their music out, record themselves while listening to the track. And it seems to me to be about the easiest way to get something from them. I'm providing them with a, a track that will keep them in time and hopefully in tune. They can give me something that I know is going to be very, very, very close right out of the gate uh, to arrange and align all of these things later. Because a lot of this work is going to be done in the digital audio workstation, GarageBand, Logic, Audacity, you could use a ton of different programs. Audacity is a great program and it's free. If you don't know about it, that's a really good one. Why else is this such a helpful tool? Well, I'm sure it's quite small depending on the screen you're using and I apologize for that. But one of the amazing things about this is the ability to change the tempo without changing the pitch. So if your band is maybe not quite ready to go at full tempo, and you want to give them an t a tool to be able to rehearse and get reps in and muscle memory in at slower tempos, this is the way to do it. 
So right here in the middle of the screen, I have my main controls. And one of those right here is the speed control. And so right now I am at 1.00 X. That's one, that's 100% speed. That's one time, right? That's speed times one. Now what I can do is hit this minus button and I can quickly go down by 5% at a time. This is that same song at 75% speed. And so you can see that that could be very helpful if there's a, a tricky situation, a difficult passage, something that requires a little bit more um, quantitative work, as I call it, instead of qualitative work. Um, this can be an, an exceptionally helpful tool. Now, one of the other imp impressive things about this is you can export any file that you have in AnyTune Pro at any speed. It will keep the same settings. So something I've done in the past is I will send my students through email, through Blackboard, through Remind, through whatever you know program you have that can attach a file. I will send them a file, a track at 75% speed. And I'll label it as such. I'll say this is, the name of this song is Togo. I'll say, this is Togo at 75% speed. Then the students have a track that they can click on and, re and rehearse with on their own at exactly 75% speed. And one of the things I will do is I will export one at 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, and 100% speed, of course, and give them options. So um, I, per I personally use Dropbox but you could use iCloud, you could use a lot of other servers um, and our services. I upload those files into Dropbox and then just share the link. That way I'm not sharing such huge files with my students. Sometimes my email at OC can't handle it. Sometimes their, their um, devices might not have enough storage to save these things. So one of the things that is so powerful about this app is the, the exporting feature as well. Now, uh, it does, of course, change the pitch as well. And so what I'll do is let it play for a few seconds and I'll just crank up the pitch by a half step uh, every few seconds here. And you can kind of listen to what that sounds like. We're back to 100% speed now. So I'm just going up by half steps. There it was. Now, of course, the farther away you go, the more awkward those waveforms are going to sound. But I've just gone up uh, three half tones, three half steps, and uh, it's not too bad, actually. So if you needed to change the key of a song but maintain the tempo, if you needed to slow the tempo down and change the key, this app will do it. All you need to have is the original file of that song that you can drop into. And again, it takes lots of different files. If you need to work on your desktop, for a little while and export that whole project over into your iOS device or your Windows device. You can do that. You can export it as an AnyTune file, which means it'll be able to be opened. Um, another thing that's super helpful, down at the bottom, uh, there's the large waveform in the middle, and then there's this much smaller waveform here, which shows me the entire track. Now, right now, there's a little tab here marked letter A, and there's a little tab over here marked letter B. These are loop controls. So I can enable the loop setting here. And then this orange section in the middle gets highlighted. And if I click play, oh, I need to set my cursor there, don't I? There we go. So in this piece, this is the guitar solo section. Maybe your guitar player wants several chances to kind of run through that in rehearsal. You can set this up to loop. I'm going to fast forward to the end of the loop for you. And it just jumps right back to the beginning of the loop. So one of the things that's really helpful about this is um, obviously if you need to rehearse just one section and you don't want to try to use your finger to toggle or you don't want to use the mouse to try to find those specific things all the time, you can use the loop function. And there's even something called loop trainer mode, 
which you can set a beginning tempo and an ending tempo. And every time it does, it goes back for the loop, it will increase the tempo by one tenth of that gap. So if you're trying to get your students to go from 100 beats a minute to 120 beats a minute, you can enable the loop trainer mode and say, all right, I want you to make 10 loops here in loop trainer mode. I'm going from 100 to 120. So every time it goes through, increase the tempo by two clicks. And it will do that automatically. And two clicks is almost imperceptible depending on the, the nature of the music. So your students in a relatively short amount of time can really start to build up their speed. And again, you can, if they have the app, they can do this themselves. Um, but if you're running a rehearsal through Zoom, you could have this up. Your students could be, call, be called in, muted, and then you play this for them. They're practicing on their own at home. That's how we're doing it at OC. All of the students call in. I ask them to be on camera. And then I have them do a very quick audio check to make sure everything's working because sometimes I do have them play individually. But then I'll say, okay, everybody get your music up. We're going to start at letter A. And then we're going to go from letter A to letter C. Here's the tempo. Here's your count in. Ready, go. They're muted. I see them playing or what I hope is playing. Uh, I have to trust that they're actually playing and not just pantomiming. Um, but every once in a while I'll ask and say, hey, so-and-so, would you mind playing that lick at letter C uh, to check style, right? And then I can tell if they're actually getting better. I can do a little bit of assessment individually in that kind of a scenario. Hey, One Mr. other Baker, thing. Yes. I just noticed in our, our chat, uh, Kimberly Skinner asked, can she do the same type thing with smart music? If their music is already set up on it, they can wear headphones, record that way, and then drop it into GarageBand. I believe so. I haven't used smart music in quite a while, um, but when I was using it, it was quite powerful. It was a very powerful program. Um, and I do know that in smart music, you are able not only to set complete tempos, you're able to you know, slow down a section of that track you know, by itself. You can do a lot of things. So I would imagine as long as the students are recording in a file format that GarageBand can understand, you should be just fine. Awesome, thanks. Absolutely. One other thing about rehearsing with AnyTune Pro, and again, I don't own stock in AnyTune Pro. Um, I'm not really advocating for it other than I've used it and it seems to do a lot of what I need as a music educator, especially remotely is you can insert markers. So uh, it would be a little bit cumbersome and a little awkward and would be a time waster. Uh, if you see down here, I'm going to disable the loop. Uh, what you can see here is I've got the entire track here in a waveform at the bottom. What if I need to work on letter I? What if I need to work on letter J? Well, AnyTune Pro allows you to add markers in real time and go back and edit those anywhere you need to edit them. So I've already, I feel like a cooking show. I have one that I've prepared beforehand and uh, I'm going to show you this one, I think, here we go. So now look at the waveform at the bottom. There are lots of little blue markers that are inserted into this waveform. Now, what I did was I just played the song and every time I knew that a letter was coming up, I had my score in front of me, like here comes letter C, I would just click the add a bookmark button right there as it came through. If you miss, you can just grab them and edit them a little bit left and right if you want, but it seems to do the job well for me. Now, if I need to go to letter I, I can just double click on the marker for letter I and it takes me right there to the I position mark. You can use numbers if you need to use numbers. Um, I have. I have not been able to find out in the AnyTune settings if it will default to letters or numbers. It seems to default to, uh, to, to numbers. So as I click, it's just gonna go one, two, three, four, five. However, it's very easy to pull up a list of your markers and then just edit those later. Maybe it's uh, rehearsal numbers. You need 22, but the next one might need to be 45. The next one might need to be 80 something. You can do that. You can make them custom so that then very quickly, you can jump to any part of the song and then rehearse that. And usually what I'll do is I'll tell my band, okay, everybody, we're gonna start at letter I. I'm gonna back up just a few seconds and you'll be able to hear that. And again, it's sort of training their ears to get used to the track and knowing not only how to count their measures of rest, but what is happening in the music beyond their part um, that helps them cue into letter I. And so you can just start a little bit before letter I, you can start at letter I, any other rehearsal markings. 
It's very, very, very powerful. And so that's what I have been doing primarily. Um, what I have been uh, doing is having my students call in. Um, they like to see each other, even though we're virtual. Uh, they do like to see each other and they like to be a part of something that's a little bit bigger than themselves stuck in their rooms. Um, and we're working on one song right now. I've had to decide that in a normal jazz band concert in the spring, we would have done 10 to 12 different pieces in lots of different styles. But that, that doesn't seem as feasible right now, given the situation. So I've had to say, well, I want to maintain quality, so I'm just going to lose the quantity. Um, maybe we do one or two or three songs at the most uh, in this way. The first one's always the hardest. After that, everybody gets the pattern and they can figure it out. So for me, I've had to just make those um, concessions. I've just kind of had to say, well, we're not going to get to do 10 songs and feature the saxes on this one and feature the trumpets on that one. We're going to have to just move forward in a different way. And this seems to be working. The students seem to be responding. Um, they're good to call in. They seem to be good uh, to practice and to perform. Uh, I can see them, you know, doing that. And then, like I said, we'll run through things. I'll talk them through not only the music and the style, but I'll give them tips uh, on how to record and what's going to make it easier. And uh, the other day, I showed them live on camera how to add that metronome count in to an audio track so that if they ever wanted to do that, they were getting that. And you can see the nature of the education uh, is shifting slightly. Um, rather than only doing music performance all the time in jazz band, now my students are getting very little, you know, but hopefully important nuggets of technology or thought process or signal processing. My guitar player was asking all kinds of questions about how did you get that set up? Because he wants to be able to have really good guitar sounds um, so that he can teach his online private lessons better and have really good sound for his students. And so, as awful as this situation is, I'm so excited to see so many people learning new things, working through new technologies, and um, we're all being forced out of our comfort zone. And I think that's a good thing. I think it's good for our students to see that and to see us modeling positivity uh, at, during this time and to see us saying, hey, I know this is going to look different, but we never would have done a virtual jazz band before. And this is going to be such a great opportunity and coaching them through that and showing them that it's not necessarily the end of jazz education, at least at OC. Now, I am sure that so many of you um, are already doing some great things. So I would like to now, uh, I've kind of spoken a little bit longer than 30 minutes, but I'd love to hear if there are any other questions um, or if we can kind of answer anything that may be in the chat. Uh, so I'm going to turn it back over to Derek now. That's kind of what I have to say. Thanks, sir. I'm trying to unclick a few things. Um, I'm, I'm going to thank you very much. That was awesome. And I'm like going, how can I use this at the music store to, yeah. to do some things? Because I, it's not as hard as we think it is sometimes. That's right. I think that, 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 our, that we talk ourselves out of doing a, a lot more than we're capable of. If we just uh, rely on each other, ask questions, that a lot of this is possible. I know that Kim asked a question and thanks for joining us this morning, Kim. I appreciate that. Is there anything he didn't cover that maybe you would like to hear his opinion on, whether that's equipment or did he hook all that up? Did you hook all this up yourself? Um, I did, but I had to watch a lot of YouTube tutorials. YouTube has been my friend uh, throughout a lot of this. And so a lot of various reviews and that's important too. go find out people who have used this equipment in their situations before you have and and go out and decide what is the best usb microphone for example one of the things that was so important for our voice teachers of course was that if we're using zoom the sound that is captured on the student's side needs to be faithfully rendered on the teacher's side. And the voice has so many nuances and qualities, as every instrument does. Um, and so our voice teacher, Dr. Jennifer Voigt, did some research and found what she considered to be the best value. Um, and that is, again, I'm not hawking any particular company, but for us, it was uh, a company called Blue. They make lots of different USB microphones, and they have a model called the Snowflake. It's very small. Um, it's very inexpensive. It's about $40. 
uh, and our students could afford to, to purchase that. Uh, and for those who couldn't, we increased their scholarship by $40 to try to make up the difference. They were able to purchase those blue snowflake microphones, plug them directly into the USB, and then select that microphone when they open up their Zoom call, uh, the settings for the sound, just select that microphone, and it seems to be working really well. Um, now, are there more expensive and better functioning microphones? Absolutely. But you're going to have to decide what is the price point and the feature set that gives you the most bang for your buck. I didn't have to do a ton of purchasing. Um, a couple of cables here and there, which I happily got from Intune Music and Sound. And those guys helped me, you know, just arrange a few things. Um, but all, all of this is plug and play. So this audio interface, you, 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 it, it's powered by the USB. So once you plug it into your computer, it, it's on, it's working. And then you can just put in your inputs. This particular audio interface takes the three-pronged XLR, but it also accepts uh, the quarter-inch mono or TRS cable. So if you just want to plug your guitar directly into the box, you can do that. Uh, it's really, really powerful. This also, uh, special plug for the Presonus, any artists who want to do some live music streaming, this Presonus has a USB out as well. And you can plug that USB out into your smartphone or your whatever device you're using to live stream, and it will capture that sound, not like the built-in iPhone microphone sound, which is not so good. So um, there are so many good reasons beyond just the quarantine to purchase a, a good digital interface. And I did get this from uh, Intune. I, I put up a, a list of some of the stuff that we know you're using. Uh, some cases we modified to what we actually stock and can easily uh, get for you. No, we don't have the mic that you said you use for the students, but we have compatible or a comparable mic that we can get that will do the same thing. And these are the prices you're gonna see on the internet. Uh, if you talk to your specific salespeople, uh, you know, we'll see how that goes. But uh, these are the items that I know that that Mr. Baker is using, except in like the mixer. We just put the MG06, which is a Yamaha 6 channel, which is enough to get you doing what you're doing. Uh, but just as a real distinct or a real easy example, I'm just talking through a webcam. And when we did this yesterday, everybody goes, man, Eric really sounds better than you. Well, I, he's using an awesome mic. It's all and in the I, microphone. But the point I'm trying to make is, if this is all you have, is your webcam, you can still do it. I mean, you know, it's going to be better if you can hook up uh, a system like this. And and I, I think also, Mr. Becky, you would agree, it kind of depends on what you're trying to do with the setup that you're creating. Um, that's right. I guess what I'm trying to say is you can go from here to here with this, just depending on what you have and what you really want to accomplish. Yes, no? Absolutely. And and I want to, again, I want to say, and I see that um, the, the the fourth item down there, the Yamaha MG06 mixer, it's a, fant it's a fantastic mixer. It costs $99. Um, this mixer that I'm using, only because it's what we had at OC already, um, is like $1,500. It's completely overkill. Now, it's very powerful. And if you need it to do what it's designed to do, then it's absolutely the right tool. But don't let, I don't want any music educators out there to hear um, money, 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 and think that, well, I have to you know, invest all of this cash into doing this successfully. At the end of the day, your students want to see you and they want to see each other. And if that means you just are throwing your smartphone up on a music stand and getting after it, then absolutely do that and, and make some music, make some art. Um, so much of what we do as music educators goes beyond the music classroom. Um, and they're looking to us and to other adults to help them navigate this crisis. So um, there's a great meme that I've seen that shows, you know, a picture of a, of a desk you know, maybe like mine, it's just got all this gear everywhere. And it says private teaching online, the teacher's side. And then the other side of the meme is the student side. And it's like an old Nokia flip phone just sitting on a music stand. And so much of that is like what we're dealing with. You know, I've got all this great gear and these studio mics and headphones and all this great stuff. And, you know, my students are barely getting signal from their router, you know, across the house. And so their audio is choppy and all kinds of things. We do Listen. have a few questions, sir. You, you good for a few questions? Yeah, I was just going to say, like, don't let the money thing or the equipment thing be a hindrance. Throw your phone up there. Get started. 
if you're curious about how to get better quality, that's where you're going to have to start making some of those decisions. Right. Mr. Johns is asking from Andrews, what uh, vocal mic are you using? Did you say it's a dynamic mic? It really sounds like a condenser mic. Are you using EQ, compression, et cetera, to beef up the voice through the mixer? Thank you, Darren Johns, for that excellent question. You're listening to 97.9 Smooth Jazz. No, um, this, I'm going to bring it up into frame. This is the Shure SM7B, a uh, very iconic and well-known vocal microphone um, for both speech, podcasting type things. It's That's one of the reasons that drew me to this particular mic for the teaching element is it works well for the voice. Um, this microphone has two settings on the microphone. There's a high pass filter or what's called low cut. You can cut off the lows and there is a mid what they call presence boost. And so what I have found for clarity with my voice and my setup is I leave the low cut alone. If I, if I cut too much lows, it gets really tinny and through computer speakers and through phone speakers, it's not, it's kind of harsh. So I leave the low cut flat and I add the presence boost. That's the only EQ that's going on this particular microphone. Um, I do think I have a little bit of compression because if I get a little animated or if I'm listening to music and trying to teach the students, I talk louder. <laughs> so I, I want to make sure that I'm not clipping or doing anything crazy. So on the mixer, there are some dedicated presets for vocals with a little bit of compression. Um, I wish I could turn on the gate. There's a, a very, very loud air conditioning vent in my office. It is infuriatingly loud. And uh, so I used to mess with a, a, a gate, which meant... Um, if my sound level was quiet, then the, the mic would shut off all the sound, right? So that I would kind of find how loud is that fan? And then anything right at that level, just cut out all the sound. And then when I would speak, then it would let my voice through because I raised up above that threshold. Um, a lot of that though makes it, makes it sound really weird. I'll give you a brief example. If I turn on my noise gate for this particular channel, it does cut out the background sound, which I'll let you listen to now. Ugh. Um, and so if I engage the gate, that background sound probably went away, but you can still hear it in my voice. Also, the gate, even with the long delay settings I have, tends to chop up my voice sound and it sounds a little unnatural. And if any of my students have a bad internet connection in that moment and it drops a little bit of my signal, they're going to have a hard time understanding me. So I ended up just taking off the noise gate and dealing with the background noise, which frustrates me, but that's okay. Awesome. Hope that answers that question, Mr. Johns. Uh, Elaine Truitt from Morton. Oh, there was, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you real quick. Darren, you asked another question about, uh, it is a dynamic microphone. I have used condenser mics. They're so sensitive that, that that background noise is even more apparent. So this is a dynamic microphone and it is uh, very gain hungry. You need a lot of good gain. So uh, one of the items you saw on Derek's list was a cloud lifter. That's one brand of, uh, of an activator. What it does is it adds 20 dB of gain to this microphone. It goes between the mic and your mixer. And so that cloud lifter uh, is an activator. It makes, um, it will, basically you run 48 volt phantom power from your mixer into that cloud lifter um, and that's where it stops. So you, dynamic mics don't need phantom power. So um, the, the power stops at the cloud lifter um, and doesn't get into the mic. So it's, it's kind of designed to be used for these kinds of higher end vocal mics that need a lot of gain. Um, and so that's, that's one thing that makes this sort of behave a little bit better. Um, so yeah, the next question. Good. This is from Elaine Truitt, our, one of our faves from Morton, Texas. Says, you have said this earlier in the broadcast. Hi. <laughs> uh, but could They're you taking repeat? care of us here at OC. They, they have been in every day to take care, make things clean, organized. It's, it's incredible what they're doing here. Sorry. Cool. She said, you've said this earlier in the broadcast, but could you repeat the file format you are using and what programs are friendly with each other? In other words, you can edit export files between these programs. I have found, I have found the most 
friendly formats to be uh, for sound, MP3 or WAV. Uh, WAV files and MP3 files are almost universally accepted. So if you can export your files as one of those, that's good. Now, if you're going to do high-end kind of things, you're going to use special encoding and, and have lossless files, but they're massive. Um, basically, MP3 and WAV files do, in my opinion, the best job of giving you ease of use because a student can send it to you from any device, can export WAV and MP3, and just about any program can import that file as well. Cool. Okay, this is, I, I'm interested in this as well. We know that you showed us your setup from the side that you have a separate microphone that you use for your instrument. Yeah. And, and, and we're just kind of curious if you can demonstrate how you do that, how you played, and what it sounds the difference between. Not trying to put you on the spot. I don't yeah, know man. You it with you. I haven't even warmed up this morning. Uh, neither have we. <laughs> uh, sure. Let me see if I can share that again with you. There we go. So, and I'll move my vocal mic out of the way just a bit. I'll scoot back so you can see. I know that's not the best framing, but it is what it is. So this mic is uh, Bayer Dynamic is the brand. It's the M160. It's a ribbon microphone. Uh, and ribbon microphones are really nice for brass instruments, at least in my experience. They sound really nice. So this particular one is connected to channel two in my mixer. And what that allows me to do is very quickly, with one touch on this little touchscreen, mute and unmute different mics so that the sound is a bit as, as clean as it can be. So I'm going to get my trumpet. I'm going to say a short prayer. And uh, then I'm going to play a note or so in here. Now, if I didn't have this mic and I just played... You could probably hear some sound, but it's really not very helpful. It's probably just muffled in the background, and it's all full of cracks. So now I'll mute my vocal mic and unmute the dynamic, or the, pardon me, the Bayer dynamic here. And so I'll usually ask the students, you know, how is that level for you? And then I can increase or decrease the level here on the mixer. Basically, all that does is it gives me two options on how I'm doing it. It's not necessary, any, like any webcam mic would still pick up my voice and my trumpet, but that's how I'm using it here um, in, the, uh, in the mixer. And I'm gonna boost it. So that was a little bit too loud because it started to clip just a hair, but you can kind of fine tune the levels for yourselves and, and for the devices that you're using and what your students are using. Um, but this is also helpful for when I am playing the track through any tune and we're rehearsing, um, I can play on my side of the Zoom call, I can play in real time and the students can hear my trumpet and the track at the same time. So I can't hear them with the track in my ears, but they can hear anything coming from my side in real time. And that has also proven to be a very helpful rehearsal tip. If I've got my trumpets in a sectional, I can say, okay, trumpets, we're gonna start at letter Q, here we go, I start it, I can play with them, or I can play with the track, and they will hear my sound through the trumpet and the studio, or uh, and the track at the same time. So that's a little bit of a helpful tip as well. Um, it's just that it can't come back to me from their side in real time. Okay, we got another one from out in Georgia. It says, there are USB to Lightning or C adapters as well. Can you recommend an audio app for phone or iPad? Um, I'm guessing for recording. Um, there are so many. I've, I've not used all of them, and it kind of depends on what you want to do with it. So if you're just trying to get a really good quality um, capture, then I would imagine any anything that has you know high bit rate, high capture that way, um, or just gives you the options you want. I've used GarageBand. Again, I'm an Apple person, so I've just used GarageBand on my iPad or my phone. Um, it, it does what I need it to do. Um, if you start to play around with those apps and discover something that is lacking, then you might kind of want to look around. But for just strict audio capture, um, easy thing to use if you're using a smartphone. There's probably a voice memos type app. Um, that's probably pretty easy, just quick and, and dirty. Just like set it up there and get something recorded and you can export those files. But uh, something dedicated as an audio app would be pretty good. I'm trying to think through of what I have used uh, for that uh, as far as apps go. I, 
I don't do much recording on my phone. I, I'll, I'll use the computer and I'll use something like GarageBand. I'm going to ask, do you have a mic that you use with that that's better than the, or do you find that the iPhone or a smartphone mic is typically high enough quality? Yeah. Yeah, so um, there are lots of really good mics out there. One that I've one that I've bought and used and really like is also made by the brand Shure. It's the MV88 Plus. MV88 Plus. It's very small. I wish I had it with me now because it is so cool. The whole thing fits inside a little case about the size of an egg. And you open it up and it's just a microphone and a lightning port. And so you can stick that directly into your iPhone. It comes with a dedicated app. This is this is an app that I should have I should have mentioned a second ago. It comes with the Sure Motive app. Um, as soon as you plug in the lightning thing, it'll prompt you. Or as soon as you plug in the microphone, it'll prompt you to install the app. The app gives you gain control. You can set on that microphone the 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 field. Is it just like a 75% field or a 75 degree field? Is it a 120 degree field? Uh, monocardioid, stereo left and right. You could even just put that microphone in your phone, hold your phone up between you and someone else and do a podcast style interview. And the, the microphone will pick up your side, that side and reject everything else out here. It's incredibly powerful and wow. it's about this big. Um, and it gives great audio. And one of the important things on that one is you can adjust the gain you can do digital gain control. So um, you can do a quick sound check, it'll give you the meters. If you start to clip or go up into the red, you just touch the screen, drag that gain down. Um, and then it also has presets for compression. It has presets for EQ. It'll say, are you using this for speech, for music, for an instrument? Uh, what are you using this to, to capture? And then the microphone will do its own digital conversions inside the mic to capture that. For the money, and again, it's about $100, $150, um, it's the easiest thing to use. I can't tell you if it's the best thing, but it is so easy to grab that, stick it in, and other apps on the phone will default to that if it's plugged in. There's a little green LED on the, on the microphone, and any app that you open that is using the microphone, the LED will light up and show you. So we've done um, uh, uh, Zoom calls, with that microphone. So if you're looking for something for, you know, a student to be able to have a better audio sound on their Zoom call or for their remote teaching, that's a great one to use. Or if you're looking for one, you just want to have something, it's so small, I, I should have brought it. It's so incredibly small and powerful. Sure MV88 Plus. Almost looking ahead though, I mean, is that is that good enough to sit on the stand when you're doing a, if you just want to get a quick recording of what the band's doing? Yes, yes it is. If you need to do it quickly, it's a great way to do it right there on your phone. Awesome, because I know that we can do that. And another person said that they use the AT2020 USB mic. Um, That's a solid yeah, microphone. We, we use that a lot for podcast situation when people come in the store, they want to set up because of the USB function to it. Um, also, Kyler, our Midland store manager, said you can't, you probably have to, I laugh at a lot of my director friends. Excuse me, I laugh with you. We are notorious for not having the newest, latest, greatest. <laughs> but Kyler says you can get GarageBand on your iPhone. Yes, you can. I have also found that if your phone is past a certain age, it doesn't support it anymore. So if you've got some of the newer uh, iOS devices, then they support GarageBand and you can carry it with you all the time. That's right. Awesome. So anything else, guys, before we start kind of wrapping this up, I'm going to ask Eric to do one favor for me. I'm going to revisit the top, and if any of you weren't in yet, if you can go back to your uh, your other camera and just simply talk about signal flow and what you've got one more time. Uh, we do have those lists available of, of what he's talking about. I know that uh, Stephen, Angel, Tim, Dave, Jared, um, Zach, and Abilene, we're all excited to talk to you about it if you want us to, if you need some help. Uh, we are here for you, uh, Kyler in in uh, the Midland store, uh, Andrew and Alex over here in Odessa. We're, we're happy to talk to you about this stuff. But if you could just walk us through, you know, you don't have to elaborate in great depth, but these are what you're using. This is what it does. One more time before we wrap it up. Absolutely. So uh, it starts here at the microphone. So this is, again, the Shure SM7B microphone. It's dynamic. Um, it plugs in via XLR. That cord, the other end of that cord, uh, is going right into my mixer. Now, 
again, you don't have to have a dedicated mixer. I could do almost everything I did today with just this device, which is an audio interface. I'll talk more about that in a second. But if you want more options to push sound through your computer than this will give you, then you have to kind of include something like this. So this is a, a mixer. Put in your channels, set it up. The output, the main left and right output of my mixer is what is feeding the main left and right input on this digital interface. So this audio interface plugs into my computer via USB. It accepts the signal. You can set the levels here. Um, it's probably hard to see, but there are little LED lights that are kind of flickering underneath. You can check your signal levels here. This goes into the computer. And then whenever I open up a Zoom call, I just select this PreSonus audio box as my microphone. And then that means any signal that's going into that is what is being picked up by Zoom. Another thing is I also set my speaker settings in Zoom to this because then I can monitor everything I'm doing through this headphone port. And then the headphone port has an individual volume control. So I can turn up my headphones without turning up all the signal that's going into the Zoom call. And then this is just going, of course, up to my ears. Um, these are the Sennheiser uh, HD 280 um, headphones. Um, you can use AirPods with Zoom. That, all that's fine. Um, I was having a little bit of unreliability. Uh, that's not uh, unreliability um, with the Bluetooth connection kind of getting interrupted. So I just went with a hardwired version to get away from that. Um, and that's kind of it. And then of course I have this other um, small microphone here. Again, all this stuff is stuff I had at OC. So um, I just kind of like raided the closets. This is a, a ribbon microphone that sounds really nice for brass players. And so I just grabbed it and stuck it up on the on the short stack stand here. So it's kind of close by. Um, also there, I do have an output on the back of this. In addition to the USB going into the computer, the output of my audio box uh, interface is feeding my desktop speakers so that I can listen to things in my computer without always having headphones on. This dial here is the main output for those speakers. And so if I were to turn that up, you'd hear all those things that we're doing, but that would be annoying, so I won't do that. So that's again, a very quick and dirty um, show of, of the gear. Oh, this camera, this is super cool. This camera that you're looking at um, is an old iPhone that I had at my house and there's some apps that will turn your phone into a USB webcam. And you can look up, you know, you can Google search for that. There's tons of different ones. You install the app on the phone, you install the desktop app so it can talk to each other, and then I can bring that into Zoom as well. So if you need to have multiple cameras, that whole setup took five minutes. Download the apps on both places, sync them up either USB or Wi-Fi, or there are other things like NDI protocol, but that's getting complicated. Um, and now I've got a secondary microphone or uh, the camera over here that I can go to. So that was also super easy. And that's just an old iPhone I had sitting around like iPhone six. That's it's amazing that it works as well as it does. Cool. Okay. I'm going to ask you a question. You're wearing headphones today. Do you always wear headphones when you teach? Mm, if I'm teaching through zoom, yes. And here's the reason why. If I don't use headphones, I have to use speakers to hear the students on the other side. Right. If my microphone is hot and, and on, it is possible to get a lot of feedback and echo. If those speakers are pushing their sound into the microphone, well, the microphone's picking up and putting it right back into the system, and that's where the loop happens. So I have found that I need headphones to be able to hear them really clearly. I can turn up the volume as much as I need um, for that. If you're just opening up your laptop and using Zoom, Zoom has some audio filtering and, and processing that it does to try to mitigate that problem. So if you are using your computer speakers, I think the computer knows like, okay, mute the microphone for a little bit, you know, so that you don't get as much feedback, but it's not a perfect system and you will get feedback in your Zoom call. These are because they're comfortable. Um, I had a really nice pair of like in-ear wired headphones and they work great. Um, but they were just a little bit uncomfortable after a while. And I'm, I'm honest, we're all on Zoom calls all the time now. So um, I just decided to get something that's over the ear. It's not putting direct pressure on my ear. It gives great sound. And I can monitor my own voice while I'm talking. That was another thing. It seemed odd, 
to have headphones um, or like not be able to hear my own voice as I'm speaking in real time. So the headphones allow me to monitor my voice and hear what they're hearing and be able to tweak it if needed. You know, I'm a bass guy. I, I play bass. And I find that the over-the-ear headphones are my go-to for it's more comfortable and I can hear the frequencies I want to hear. I don't miss frequencies. Mm -hmm. I wear IMs live. They get pretty uncomfortable. I have decent ones that pick up most of the low frequency, but I, I, I default to those over the ear cans all the time. I, I guess that's old school, but I, it, I really appreciate them. And they're not that expensive to get a good set. So. No, they're not. And I will say a, a really nice tip for any instrumentalists out there or singers is just pop one ear off, you know, just have one ear open. Yeah. yeah, you'll 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 feel better. It's like, oh, that's the sound I'm used to. So just pop one ear off if it feels weird to use both. Um, I see a ton of people who do that, and it does it does work really well. I do that sometimes too, especially, and I've realized this is a different situation. When I put the headphones on, I tend to go into Derek world. Yeah, I forget everything that's, and I just kind of glaze over and, and and listen to what I want to. If I keep some crowd mic or take one ear off, then I'm still present in the real world with everybody else. Um, one comment that was made, and I think this is a definitely need to check into this. I don't know if you did this, Mr. Baker, but especially in the ISDs, certainly some of this could probably be funneled from a tech budget as opposed to the music supply budget in your school. Uh, I think that's a smart thing to go ask. Look, this is what I'm doing. I need the technology to continue teaching. It's probably great timing. Uh, and, and, and see if some of that can come from technology budget instead of your budget or orchestra or choral. Yes, so, absolutely. Uh, ask, you know, this is this is instructional supply for the classroom, not necessarily niche gear just for music. Um, and although all the stuff I had was in the music building, I was, like I said, I raided my band hall closets for this. Um, it, it is something that could be used across the campus um, for good quality teaching. Um, and I, I think it would be helpful as much as possible for our music people to help inform our IT people um, about best practices for sound. I, I go to meetings across the country and you can tell who set up the sound. Was it an IT person who is really good with computers but is not so trained on EQ and, and, and good signal? Um, or was it somebody with a really musical ear? And so in order to defeat the 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 troublesome meetings that we all have um yeah get get acquainted with a little bit of technology music technology signal path eq those things it's really not as crazy as it sounds um because you can help inform people uh from your it department about why these things are needed it folks are always looking at the budget and they're looking to get um the lowest cost and and rightfully so it's the taxpayers money let's let's be good stewards um but sometimes you can inform hey for an extra fifty dollars you're gonna get way more you know improvement for much less money you know jump and so i would encourage everybody to at least start the process of educating yourself on some of this as much as you can and i would say this as well and, and correct me if you think i'm wrong or any of any of y'all that are uh, uh, chatting with us this is kind of a necessary high focus point right now mm -hmm. but the reality is the silver lining if you will we can probably utilize this even once everybody's back in school, even once we have all our students back and we see them every day, there's no reason to stop using the technology. It's not like it's just for now. So think long-term, think about how we can use this in the future and go ahead and, and design, and we're glad to help you with that, purchase in long range thinking, not short-term, what can I get by with? Flip side of that, you probably got enough to get by right now if you just go digging around in the closet. But if you're going to actually do some purchasing for this, think about the fact that this is probably something you can use even beyond, you know, social distancing, shelter in place measures. So uh, I know we've got a fantastic install crew here that I always do this. Hello. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Hold on. Hey, Michael. And I just kind of pass it off or to Tim Jones and they're, they're genius and my brain only holds so much. I'm sorry. I can't, can't do all that. But um, I think Derek, you make a really good point about thinking long-term. 
the only reason I wasn't super scared about moving to this remote teaching is because I had been using that app, AnyTune Pro, in my rehearsals previously. Now, I wasn't using it live like I am now, live. Um, I was using it, producing tracks, exporting those for practice tracks at home for my students. Um, but now, um, because I was using that beyond a quarantine or a shelter in place, I had those skills and I'm gonna continue to have them later. Um, another thing that had, had come to my mind a second ago, like why would you need to do this again later? Oh, um, Odessa College is working on a podcast. And I got an email and they said, hey, we need music for our podcast and we think it'd be cool if we had some original music, could you record some things? And you know, it was one of those great emails, it's like, hey, make up some music. <laughs> and I was like, absolutely, I'll do it. So I got with some of my students, we sat down, uh, just used the rhythm section from the jazz band and sat down and like gave, you know, came up with a few grooves and, and composed a little bit in real time. Um, did a quick and dirty recording with my phone sent those samples to the podcast you know developers at the college and said do any of these grooves you know strike your fancy like do, does any of these do any of these work and they said yeah we like this one like, great so then i was able to sit down with the students arrange it a little bit more and then teach them how to record so we used ex all of this equipment that you see is what i use I use this touch mix. We would record into this. There's an SD card function. You can just pull that out and drop it into GarageBand. Super easy. Um, and then I would show them. They would come into my office and as part of our uh, class time, I'd bring them in and we would like work on how to do um, mixing. You know, very quick, easy mixing. And they learned so much about their own performances after doing that. There's no, no better thing than to record yourself and listen back. Oh, yeah. So... Our, our learning outcomes have gone beyond just the performance elements, which I still think are crucial and vital and, and the foundation, but we're moving further and further into the 21st century. And I know that my colleagues in music schools across the country, uh, as related to NASM, our big push over the next few years is how do we prepare music students for the 21st century? And, and this is a great time to boost our own knowledge as educators, to be able to pass that on to our students. Yes, they're digital natives, but they don't know this stuff the way we think they do. And it can be very easy to say, oh, well, they're young, they know computers. Many of them don't. They know smartphones, they know social media, um, but if you were to tell them to you know, take this file and, and go into GarageBand and do some stuff with it, they wouldn't know how to do that. We're still gonna need to teach them. So um, I'm not gonna win any Grammys with my mixing skills. I am not here to say that I'm, I know all of these things. I know very little, um, but that very little has helped me in these real ways. So I, I agree, this is a very important time for all of us to be pushed out of our comfort zone and learn some new things that we can pass on to our students. Awesome, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit. I hope you don't mind. Yesterday you showed me your cool lower third. Can you create one of those that might have contact information that you're willing to share uh, with anybody that's watching while I, ask you another question i uh, other... think i can, think cool. i can i have to think it through right now let me let me figure this out all right uh i'm gonna try this in real time um this will be kind of an exciting thing hopefully i won't bore everybody let let me let me share let me just share my screen and kind of go from from scratch while you're doing that uh bow over in midland asked is there any natural latency? Is there any lag that you found in Zoom while you're trying to teach with it? Either side. Is it dependent yes. on the internet connections? Yes. And the lag changes from student to student based on internet connections. And I will say um, internet usage, I read an article the other day, it's like up 20 fold or something. It's just like global internet usage is just peak Crazy. all the time. So you're never guaranteed. Um, so here's my, here's my screen, I'm gonna start fresh. Now I'm using this free software down here called OBS. OBS stands for Open Broadcaster Software. Can you guys see all that? Yep. All right. So I have it in what's called studio mode right now. This is the preview window. This is what would be going out. Open Broadcaster is designed for live streaming. So if you do wanna go live on Facebook and you wanna have different cameras, uh, different things that you're sharing. You can build all of that here in OBS, and then only this window over here will get shared. So uh, I'm gonna exit studio mode, and I'm gonna go into this preview. So you see I am I'm using my 
my computer camera, just the camera that's built into the iMac. And then I've added this, this text and I've added this graphic. So the graphic is in red, the text is now in red, and then my camera is in red. So what you see over here is the scene. And this scene is just called scene. It's just the default scene. And what I've added to this scene is some text. I've added this lower third banner and I've added my face cam. So let me go very quickly through the steps that it took me to do that. I'm gonna open Chrome and I'm gonna slide it in here and make it a little smaller. So I use a program called Canva. Canva is free, um, but you can get a pro version as well and it's a design software. And so what I did was I just created a new design I'm going to use custom dimensions. I know that my resolution here in OBS is 1920 by 1080. So I want my width to be 1920 pixels and the height I believe I used was 200 pixels and I'm going to go create design. And what that does is it brings up this little bar here at the dimensions I want. What you can do is select from all these various things. I'll just do a quick background. Uh, let's do a nice brick background it brings that in now all i have to do is go up here to the top where the download button is and download that as a png file that's what's suggested um, you can see jpeg or any other file source that you want but we're just going to stick with png you can change the size here but i still want it at that and i'm going to click download it will do its magic and then it's dropped it down here into Chrome. I'm just gonna pick it up and drop it over here for now onto my desktop. And that's all I need from Canva. Um, I'm going to build a new scene over here just to practice. And we'll call this, oh, scene two. That works well. Let me click okay. Now notice everything went dark because I haven't added any sources. Right here, I'm gonna click the plus button. I'm gonna go down to video capture device. I'm gonna call this um, iMac for now, or uh, I can use one that I've already got. I forgot I've already got an existing one. So let me just click add existing and click face cam and say go. So now it's brought in this to my scene. I can just click this and rescale it and there we go. Now I also want to bring in an image. And so here's my image source selection. I'm gonna call it uh, lower third two and click OK and it will ask me to browse for it. So I can go, I know it's on my desktop here. So here's my untitled design and there's my image. It's brought it in and I'll click OK. Now I'll put it up here at the top. So I'm just gonna drag it down to the bottom. And the last thing I need to do is add some text. So I'll go here to my plus sign, I'll add some text and I'll just say, uh, sure, this is whatever this is. And default okay. name. Yeah, here we go contact info. Click OK and it'll say what do you want to say? Eric Baker. Can't spell my own name. There we go. Um, over here I can select which font I want to use and it has many 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 many. Um, I'll use everybody's favorite Comic Sans. <laughs> That's just for you guys. Um, and click OK. All right, so there it is. There's my contact info in the world's worst font. And it's brought it up here in the top. It's very tiny, but that's OK. I can just drag it. I can increase the size and fit it to the frame. Kind of snaps in place. Um, and that's it. That's my source. That's my new thing. Um, if I were live on Facebook or YouTube, or Twitch or any other streaming service, I could take this image and push that out as what everybody sees. I can also uh, set up a few others. I had kind of set up, um, you know, my first scene is here, uh, my Intune training. This brings up the camera that I had and uh, my face cam so that I can kind of see what's going on. I don't know if there's a lag for you guys here. Um, when we tested it, it wasn't so great. But you can see, you can set up a lot of interesting things. You can have different backgrounds that you can use. Um, I had 
uh, an open window here with my AnyTune Pro, and then I've got my rehearsal here so the students can see my face and I can see uh, what's happening on the screen. Uh, and then there's that. So that takes, you know, five to 10 minutes to build some of these things in OBS software. Uh, Zoom will already do a lot of the things that we want it to do. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. Zoom will do a lot of those things. So I didn't have to use OBS today. I could just flip to the different cameras or share my screen. If you wanna be able to do that while you're live streaming, or if you want to record something and have transitions right there, you can do that. You can record anything you put through OBS. OBS is free. There's a lot of free plugs in, plugins. It's very powerful. If that interests you, there's a million YouTube tutorials on that. Awesome. Any last questions before we start wrapping this thing up? I, I really appreciate everybody hanging out with us. Mr. Baker, great information. I'm trying to multitask and type in your... I, in the chat, I went ahead and put your... Uh, your email address so perfect um i assume you're good with any questions they might want to direct your way anything you and every, yes I and i'm happy to go ahead i'm sorry Jose, i'm happy to hear you know comments or um corrections or improvements as well please let me know it's all about sharing i also want to make sure everybody knows that your ed rep should be up to speed on a lot of the stuff we've talked about today Rick, you, you, you may need to answer this in the chat, and, and Eric may know as well. Um, I believe that this will still be on this Facebook URL until we decide to take it down, so I'll probably leave it up if you need to point some other people toward it. And uh, again, just thank you so much, Mr. Becker. Thank you. All right. I don't see any more questions popping up, so I am going to... Uh, say thank you all so much. We, I enjoy doing this. If there's some other things that we can do future-wise, I know Eric's uh, excited to do it again with his other subjects that you might want. Just get a hold of any of us, and we'll work that way. Otherwise, God bless. Please wash your hands. Maintain social distance. We'll get through this together, and now you can get through it with your students easier because you know more about it. It's all what you know. All right. Uh, we Thanks, Derek. Everybody. Thank you to everybody in tune. You guys really take care of us. Thank you for all you're doing for us. Thank you for saying that. That was very kind. Um, everybody have a blessed day. We're praying for you.